Biohappiness revolution. <laughs> Life is suffering, said Gautama Buddha. Evolution via natural selection is a monstrous engine for creating mental and physical pain. Sentient beings deserve a more civilized signaling system. Mercifully, the biohappiness revolution is imminent. Genome editing promises to transform human nature and life itself. CRISPR-Cas9 is a game changer. The biosphere can be reprogrammed. Our reward circuitry can be upgraded. CRISPR-based gene drives turn the level of suffering and bliss in the living world into an adjustable parameter. Pain can be mitigated, minimized and then abolished. Biotech can make experience below hedonic zero physiologically impossible. The world's last unpleasant experience will be a precisely datable event a few centuries from now. Transhuman civilization will be based on a new motivational architecture, life underpinned entirely by information-sensitive gradients of well-being. Genetic recalibration of the hedonic treadmill will replace the biology of suffering with life animated by gradients of superhuman bliss. And the biohappiness revolution will then accelerate. The lower bounds of transhuman well-being will be orders of magnitude richer than human peak experiences. Superhuman intensity of bliss will be matched by a lifelong superhuman sense of meaning, purpose, and significance. In short, paradise engineering. But when and how? What are the preconditions of post Darwinian life? All factory farms and slaughterhouses should be closed and the surviving victims rehabilitated. Pigs, for instance, are as sentient as small children and should be treated accordingly. The development and commercialization of cruelty-free cultured meat and animal products should be accelerated. Civilization will be vegan. Second, all prospective parents worldwide should be offered pre-implantation genetic screening and CRISPR genome editing to pre-select the pain thresholds and hedonic range of their future children. Pre-implantation screening will be hugely cost-effective. Reckless genetic experiments such as today's products of sexual reproduction should be discouraged. Ideally, all babies should be designer babies. Third, trials should begin of somatic gene therapy for existing humans. An unfolding revolution in genetic medicine promises a one-off injection for invincible mental superhealth. This promise of perpetual well-being sounds complete hype. How can the jab of a needle confer lifelong protection against physical and mental pain? But consider today's extreme genetic outliers like retired vegan schoolteacher Joe Cameron. Joe is constitutionally happy and pain-free in virtue of her unique genetic makeup. In principle, a single intravenous CRISPR infusion could tweak everyone's far and far out genes to function like Joe's. Gene edited humans rich in anandamide, and the Sanskrit term for bliss, will be blissful but not blissed out. Fourth, genome editing and CRISPR based synthetic gene drives can extend the biohappiness revolution to all free living non human animals. Pilot studies should begin of self-contained blissful mini-biospheres free from starvation, predation and the other cruelties of Darwinian life. More broadly, we need a hundred-year plan to defeat suffering throughout the living world. Surely the world isn't ready for such a utopian vision. Yet such an organisation exists. It commands global authority. The World Health Organization is dedicated to the promotion of good health for everyone as laid out in its founding constitution of 1946. And what exactly is the WHO conception of health? Quote, health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being, end quote. Note that complete, complete well-being is an astonishingly bold definition of health. Compare the incomplete mental health in the guise of information-sensitive 
dips in extreme well-being, urged by some supposedly wild-eyed transhumanists. So the world needs the counterpart of a greater Dunberg to remind politicians to live up to their responsibilities for public health. The abolition of suffering through medical science and the creation of life based entirely on gradients of intelligent bliss. <laughs> How you doing, David? <laughs> Coping! <laughs> well, that's, yeah, the, the, the gist of uh, the Biohappiness Revolution, the Abolitionist Project, but how are we going to uh, shift uh, the Overton window to uh, deliver uh, uh, the World Health Organization or, or some close approximation to the World, World Health Organization definition of health? Um, it's... Um, yeah, so I mean, I mean, sorry, I'm going to resume without uh, uh, with, without slides. Um, but yeah, there simply isn't any evidence that default levels of well-being or ill-being, on average, uh, are uh, uh, better or worse than our ancestors on the African savanna, which is uh, which is quite uh, sobering. Uh, something like uh, a grim statistics: eight hundred thousand people each year take their own lives hundreds of millions of people are clinically subclinically uh, depressed uh, it's 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 a pretty grim picture in many ways of course most people are not uh, clinically depressed but unless we are actually prepared to embark on genome reform then essentially unimaginable pain and suffering is going to persist uh, uh, indefinitely. Now, the reason uh, I started off with uh, factory farming and slaughterhouses is to highlight that there are most certainly things that can be done that don't involve reprogramming the genome. I mean, humans have got to stop systematically harming sentient beings before they can help them. But even when uh, we, uh, yeah, we, we get factory farms, slaughterhouses shut and outlawed, there will still be an unimaginable burden of suffering in the world. The hedonic treadmill will still grind, negative feedback mechanisms. Uh, sadly, uh, the, uh, yeah, the first CRISPR babies were conceived in extremely unfortunate circumstances. The, the Chinese scientist responsible has just been released uh, from, uh, from uh, a, a prison. Uh, what he was uh, really doing was not trying to create super happy, pain-free babies. What he was trying to do was to create smart babies uh, because the particular genetic mutation in question, uh, although in th uh, the official story was that it would protect would, would protect uh, babies from or future children from HIV, which may or may not uh, be the case, but in so-called animal models, uh, uh, non-human animals with the mutation uh, in question so superior show superior cognitive performance. Um, and so what could have been the start of uh, a, a revolution uh, in reproductive medicine of designer babies, uh, universal access, I would hope, to pre-implantation genetic screening and counselling for all prospective parents, unfortunately got off to an extremely inauspicious start. Um, and suppose just suppose that we take the who vision of health uh, seriously uh, and therefore it do envisage universal access to all prospective parents of pre-implantation genetic screening and counseling what uh, genes should be we be targeting um, i would start with the personally with the SCN9A gene, the so-called volume knob for pain. Uh, nonsense mutations of SCN9A 
completely abolish the capacity to experience pain, but unfortunately they also uh, abolish uh, nociception, functional ability to respond to noxious stimuli. And people born with nonsense mutations need to, uh, lead, to lead so-called cotton wool existences. Um, but there are dozens of other variants of the SCN9A gene, and if we are prepared to choose benign versions for our future children, essentially it's possible to ensure that everyone has a very high pain tolerance. Uh, if, you look, if you look at today's outlier in term, outliers in terms of pain tolerance, the kind of person who's, who says that, yeah, pain is just a useful sig sig signaling mechanism. Um, needless to say, there are thousands of uh, thousands of potential pitfalls obstacles here but nonetheless the extent to which uh, our children experience physical pain is something that we are now in a position to choose and given that all future children are unique and untested genetic experiments i think if you do think it is ethically permissible to bring new uh, uh, new life and suffering into the world to load the genetic dice uh, in your offspring's favour and choosing a benign version of SCN9A for your future child promises uh, 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 to do that. Uh, probably, I mean, the responsible thing to do would be to urge uh, relatively controlled trials, completely controlled trials probably are, are, aren't, aren't feasible. Um, but yeah, essentially creating a world uh, in which all new babies have the pain tolerance of today's high functioning outliers would get rid of an unimaginable amount of suffering uh, in the world. Hundreds of millions of people suffer from chronic pain, pain conditions. Um, as well as uh, physical pain, yeah, uh, psychological pain, uh, how, what is the most effective way uh, to elevate hedonic set points worldwide? And unlike the volume knob for pain, one can't point to a master switch uh, for hedonic tone, hedonic set points. Um, however, uh, someone like uh, Joe Cameron is extremely instructive. Simply two mutations, apparently far, far out genes, are sufficient to give her an extraordinarily high uh, hedonic uh, uh, set point. She is amazingly uh, resilient. She bounces through life. And yet at the same time, she retains critical insight, social responsibility, which is really important. Uh, she's not in some ways an ideal case study because her pain threshold is so high uh, that, yeah, childbirth, reportedly she felt like a, a tickle, uh, uh, that, uh, yeah, there are all there are potential problems. She has managed to get through life in her uh, 70, 70 odd years without too many severe problems. But if she were a, a male rugby player, for example, there would be all kinds of, of difficulties there. But uh, yeah, uh, I think the need to be uh, uh, trials of uh, babies uh, with both the far and far out uh, mutation that Joe enjoys that give uh, elevated levels of anandamide. Um, rather than my keep on talking, I really would like to throw open uh, the discussion as to what do people think uh, is uh, the best way forward in terms of shifting the Overton window because it's possible, yeah, to dream up uh, blueprints, you know, you know, everything from the creation of, 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 of happy biospheres for non-human animals to uh, universal access to pre-implantation genetic screening and counselling. But unless there is a shift in the Overton window, it's essentially, it is just utopian uh, uh, dreaming. So, yes, I don't know uh, uh, what 
people think is the best way forward. Hugo. <laughs> David, do you know what, what is state of the art in CRISPR genetic engineering? Have, have there been some real breakthroughs recently that caught the attention of the public that make them more positive towards this kind of genetic engineering? perhaps with depression or some other application? Um, it is not yet used in humans for depression or pain sensitivity. Uh, it, it was uh, uh, CRISPR genome editing was used uh, experimentally to treat people with transthyretin amyloidosis. So this is correcting an existing genetic uh, 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 problem, uh, this uh, progressive uh, and otherwise fatal disease unless it's uh, treated with, uh, 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 with, with, with drug therapy. Um, people on the whole seem to be more receptive if it comes to treatment of existing disorders what most people seem to react quite strongly against is any form of enhancement. So if one is talking about a prospect of universal access to pre-implantation screening and counselling, it needs to be in a, th in a therapeutic context. One must be speaking the language uh, of treatment of depression and pain. Now, Essentially, by the WHO definition of, of health, all genetic interventions we can consider are therapeutic. Um, but, uh, yeah, so to answer, uh, to answer your question, I mean, fortunately, there are no, obviously, biblical or Quranic prohibitions against use of, 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 of CRISPR genome editing. It is, it is a case of trying to overcome people's status quo bias. Uh, one way to overcome status quo bias I sometimes use is the kind of, you know, the thought experiments, you know, imagine we encounter an advanced civilization that has used genome editing to phase out pain and suffering, and they do live life based on gradients of bliss. Would, you, would we expect them to revert to ancestral horrors? And that sort of subverts our status quo bias, but uh, it's it's a daunting it's a daunting it's a daunting challenge. Yeah. How about like appearing on a talk show, David? Like I don't know, David Letterman doesn't <laughs> exist anymore, but <laughs> I don't even know the name of the talk show host. Uh, the talk shows today anymore. God. Well, there's Joe Rogan, you see. There's jo there's the, there's oh, yeah. Joe Rogan. Uh, oh. I mean, Nick Bostrom very bravely appeared on the Joe Rogan show to outline the simulation <laughs> uh, 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 hypothesis. Um, part of me, you see, longs for just some charismatic and being extremely wealthy counts as charismatic in a Darwinian world, but extremely uh, wealthy or charismatic billionaire who makes the cause his or her uh, his or her, her own. Um, uh, so, uh, but yeah, or or a greater or a greater Turnbuck. Uh, it's um, but. Yeah, trying to build, you know, an organization uh, to promote this. Yeah, organization building is extremely ambitious. Humans are fractious and quarrelsome. Rather than reinventing the wheel, we already have an organization that enshrines this wonderful transhuman uh, vision. So how do we get the WHO to live up to its responsibilities? Uh, yeah. And one, uh, just uh, interjecting here, it seems to me that uh, potentially like things that uh, bring together more than one value might come together. Like, uh, for example, 
Yes, in China, they might have like uh, the priority of raising the IQ of, of children uh, as opposed to, you know, like happiness or depression, pro you know, proneness and things like that. But um, could there be like emphasizing, for example, like genetic interventions that simultaneously increase intelligence and happiness, even if, you know, the conception of intelligence is a, uh, in some sense, yeah, an impoverished version, at least it would be a way of selling it. I don't know. <laughs> Yes, I mean, it, one side effect uh, of uh, pre-selecting for high IQ would be probably elevated pain thresholds because people with Asperger's, so-called extreme male brain, uh, uh, will tend to have uh, a higher pain threshold. Testo testosterone is a powerful uh, painkiller. Um, However, if, uh, if pre-selecting for uh, pain, uh, high pain tolerance and uh, uh, resistance to depression is controversial, pre-selection for high IQ genes is, is, is even more uh, controversial. Uh, in practice, far more alleles are I involved and essentially, uh, yeah, I, the only realistic way I know to actually increase IQ levels would be uh, cloning with variations that simply, uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I said that there is no master volume for IQ in the same way there is for pain. <laughs> you mean uh, you mean amphetamines are not the solution to high IQ? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's yeah, amphetamines will modestly improve cognitive performance on uh, some tasks. How amphetamines will also tend to diminish uh, empathy and cooperative problem solving. And when we see tests of cognitive performance, none of them are, are testing for the ability to cooperatively solve problems. Uh, uh, and yeah, uh, the, uh, the Wehrmacht uh, through much of the uh, Second World War was uh, propelled by uh, methamphetamine. Uh, combat troops were routinely <laughs> primed with, uh, uh, with, with amphetamines. And so, yeah, in terms of reaction times, uh, uh, yeah, that, uh, so yeah, one of my uh, worries when one talks about genome reform, yes, is that yeah, people will think of enhancing intelligence and we will get an extremely restrictive uh, conception of uh, intelligence. Whereas uh, if topically we look at the world today, yeah, in terms of are we on the uh, the brink of World War Three? Uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it's I. Uh, some years ago, I did a little presentation, Life in the Year Three Thousand, which essentially was so this utopian vision of what life is probably going to be like in the year three thousand, a transhumanist civilization of of, of super intelligence, super longevity, and super happiness. But uh, I predicted, and it's sadly, it's still my tentative prediction that there will be nuclear war uh, this century. And I sadly, I still think it's I th think it's quite likely that any uh, index of intelligence, general intelligence, is going to need uh, to be testing for social cognition, cooperative problem solving, empathetic understanding, and a whole host of tests that aren't actually measured by existing IQ tests. And yeah, the risk of offering universal access to pre-implantation genetic screening, counseling, and CRISPR, and CRISPR genome editing is that pushy parents, instead of simply wanting to have happy kids, will be wanting to have kids that will uh, excel with their sort of SATs, you know, SAT scores and, 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 and at school. Um, so, yeah, all manner of pitfalls there.
Go for it, okay. Hugo. You got your hand up, Hugo? Yeah. Uh, David, I, there are about 20,000 genes in the human genome. Mm -hmm. I, I've read that about 8,000 are involved in the wiring of the brain. Mm -hmm. So probably uh, the number of genes involved in intelligence is you know, many hundreds. So would it be a strategy to start small, um, you know, improve those characteristics that involve just small numbers of genes and then gradually work up? Yes. I mean, that makes, that makes sense. I mean, it depends what you think our most urgent priority is. If you think our most urgent priority is uh, amplifying intelligence, then it's going to make sense to clone, and it would be feasible to clone, uh, acknowledged human super geniuses who were, you know, buried like von, <laughs> uh, von Neumann, uh, maybe, yeah, tweak a few variant uh, alleles, hothouse the products in a recursive cycle of self-improvement uh, of, of, of self with presumably archaic humans even Clever archaic humans are soon being left out of the loop. Now, if one has, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, a, a conception of intelligence different from uh, mine, uh, then, yeah, biological evolution is just too slow. That essentially uh, advances in AI mean that primitive organic uh, wet rods such as us will soon be consigned to the dustbin of history. Essentially, uh, yeah, classical digital computers are going to supersede us. But uh, in my view, uh, yeah, essentially uh, the ignorance of classical Turing machines is hardwired. They are constitutionally incapable of solving the binding problem. They're not going to wake up and therefore classical digital computers are never going to be able to systematically explore the nature, variety, uh, uh, causal efficacy of conscious experience. Now, if it's something like playing chess or Go or uh, a protein structure or something like that, then uh, yeah, uh, essentially con consciousness is 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 incidental. But uh, if your conception of the enterprise of knowledge is to systematically in entails systematically exploring different state spaces of phenomenally bound consciousness then essentially, yeah, classical Turing machines aren't going to help. And I think full spectrum superintelligence is going to involve, shall we say, narrow superintelligence on a chip because everything a classical digital uh, zombie can do, you can incorporate with, within you the successor to ne Neuralink. Um, but yeah, essentially full spectrum superintelligence foreseeable future is going to uh, retain, I think, a neuronal architecture. How it is that uh, uh, animal minds are capable of solving the binding problem is extremely controversial. Very happy to talk about this if, 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 if anyone is interested. But we shouldn't be in any doubt just how extraordinarily computationally powerful phenomenal binding is. It, it, it enables uh, what naively are simply a, a, a pack of classical neurons uh, to perceive individual perceptual objects and but that's so-called local binding and also capable of uh, global binding to run real-time cross-modally matched world simulations of the external environment this is unimaginably computationally uh, powerful as one sees from syndromes where binding partially breaks down like sometimes nausea where someone can only see one thing at once or uh, echinotopsia where someone can't uh, experience uh, motion or integrative agnosia where someone can see uh, let's say uh, uh, 
a tooth and a mane but can't see a lion or uh, let alone a pride of lions. The ability uh, to run uh, phenomenally bound world simulations is yeah, the, sort of the greatest computational functional feat of animal minds over the past 540 million years. It explains our success and explains why, you know, even a little humble bumblebee is more sophisticated than the Pentagon's uh, finest. Now, of course, there are workarounds. And yeah, if we were to flash forward uh, 50, let alone 200, 500 years, we would probably be astonished at just how versatile digital zombies could be. But, they're, but they are zombies. And if we want to develop full spectrum super intelligence uh yeah we're going to need uh to use systems that can solve the binding problem um i have a question how do you test if a system is solved has solved or is solving the binding problem i guess this is uh you know along the lines of the p zombie thought pro thought experiment and uh um, well, P-zombies, according to the terms of the, the experiment, would supposedly be uh, indistinguishable from you or me. Whereas uh, in the case of systems that can't solve the binding problem, complete micro-experiential uh, zombies, um, one can actually see uh, the particular cognitive uh, deficits. I mean, for example, someone conv someone you know convinced that this is this is complete nonsense might agree to have their uh, V4 cortical neurons uh, replaced by silicon counterparts and uh, and and the relevant connectome. Now, on the standard neuroscience story, this won't make any difference at all uh, to binding if you ha if you have silicon implants your visual vi visual cortex uh, uh, you you'll be fine after the replacement but i strongly predict uh, that the result will be complete color blindness uh, uh, and so yeah as i said studying people with existing partial breakdowns of uh, f f phenomenal binding gives us a hint of just how computationally functionally powerful uh, binding is and i would say it's yeah impossible for a classical turing machine on pain of strong emergence uh, and uh, yeah philosophers philosophically minded scientists they absolutely hate uh, strong uh, I emergence. It's akin uh, to magic. If strong emergence is possible, uh, all uh, bets are off. And even if, like uh, like me, you take some form of constitutive panpsychism or non-materialist physicalism seriously, even if fancifully you replace the ones and zeros of the classical Turing machine with discrete pixels of experience, execute the code all you have is a micro experiential zombie with all the computational functional limitations that micro experiential zombies and people with partial breakdowns of phenomenal binding uh, uh un 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 undergo um so yeah there are other ways i said personally i don't think binding is a uh, a classical phenomenon uh i think yeah, I think Andre's uh, link to physicalism.com. I uh, proposed a, a sh the, the protocol for a Schrodinger's neurons uh, test uh, of the non classical basis of phenomenal binding uh, a few years ago. Molecular matter wave interferometry is exceedingly technically demanding, but the biggest uh, challenge, I would say, is that most people who look at the, uh, the proposal, uh, which is that the basis of phenomenal binding is uh, uh, coherent superpositions uh, of future processing neurons in the CNS, will just look at the effective timescales involved and think, that's crazy. It's a complete reductio ad absurdum because uh, theorists have done the maths. The, uh, the effective lifetime of neuronal superpositions in the CNS uh, is something like sort of femtoseconds or less. 
Uh, now, why should anyone take uh, the conjecture seriously? Well, to take it seriously, you have to acknowledge that binding is classically impossible. If you don't believe that binding is classically impossible, then you won't be interested in weird quantum stuff. But if, 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 if binding is classically impossible and the quantum explanation is ruled out, then when we have some form of dualism, that one of the reasons why David Chalmers actually argues tentatively in favor of dualist, possible dualist solutions is, is that, yeah, essentially he thinks there is a, 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 a structural mismatch, that there is simply no way to recover uh, the local and global global binding of your uh, your of, of your the world simulation your mind is running right now right now from uh, from neurology and the underlying physics. Now, my best guess is that there is a perfect structural match, uh, not in four dimensional space time, but of the high dimensional space uh, occupied by the d dynamics of the wave function. But anyway, I wasn't hadn't planned for this uh, uh, for this evening to be uh, 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 discussing uh, 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 quantum mind. I think we came into this by yeah the actual nature of uh, intelligence, general intelligence, uh, full spectrum uh, uh, intelligence. Uh, I would uh, argue that intelligence is a function of your entire phenomenal world simulation, uh, not merely serio-logico-linguistic thought, that we have a dreadfully impoverished uh, uh, conception of what intelligence amounts, amounts to. I would highly commend uh, Andres's uh, uh, video. Uh, 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 Andres is a much more uh, gifted performer than me, as well as uh, uh, very uh, uh, in, 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 insightful. And that, yeah, uh, as Hugo was suggesting, we should start small and modestly, I think, when it comes to uh, 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 pre implantation getting screening, counseling, and genome editing that on some fairly modest assumptions are uh, over the uh, overriding moral priority should be uh, minimizing and preventing se a severe suffering. I would in the medium term favor getting rid of all experience below hedonic zero. But if we're prepared to even to make a handful of genetic interventions, we can essentially prevent uh, all, all the forms of both severe mental and, phys and physical pain. And that needn't require uh, uh, intervention in hundreds of different genes and thousands of different alleles with the combinatorial explosion that threatens. Uh, we could focus on even uh, alleles of just half a dozen genes to get rid of the worst forms of suffering in humans and non-human animals alike. Thanks for, for, for that. I, uh, I'm, so I actually came in late, so I'm sorry if I'm going to ask a question that might have been uh, asked before, and I'm wondering about uh, um, do, do you think it, it's 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 reasonable to think that uh, working on intelligence first uh, will help uh, the pursuit to super happiness, or or do you think it might be vice versa? Uh, so that's my question. Uh, sorry. I mean, the, the argument would be that uh, if you work on yeah. intelligence first, you know, you you, you might uh, figure, uh, be more intelligent later to figure out super happiness, but might not be the other way around. So. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I mean, if I believed in the conception of intelligence and superintelligence that some transhumanists believed in, then this would make sense. If, for example, you have the I.J. Good, Miri, and he is a Yukatsky, Bostrom view of some kind of intelligence explosion of recursively self-improving software-based AI uh, and yeah essentially this intelligence explosion is apparently imminent. Eliezer has apparently updated his credences uh, 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 lately then yeah if if super intelligence is, is, is imminent then yeah super intelligence will presumably be able to solve 
all our uh, uh, all our problems. But yeah, I'm not quite sure when you came into the debate. I'm actually extremely sceptical for all sorts of reasons that classical digital computers are capable of uh, supporting general intelligence, let alone uh, 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 general uh, super intelligence. Uh, and yeah, I think we need to tackle the problem of suffering directly. And it's worth stressing that the tools to tackle the problem of suffering uh, are already available. We're not talking about, uh, you know, stuff that's invoking post-human superintelligence to solve all our problems, that it is possible even now to draw up blueprints to get rid of suffering, mental and physical pain in human and non-human animals uh, alike. Uh, yeah, 20 years ago, uh, cultured meat was sci-fi. Uh, now it's about to hit the mainstream. Uh, uh, 20 years ago, one might need to invoke something like uh, Drexler and self-replicating nanobots. Sounds complete sci-fi. We now know uh, if we're prepared to use synthetic gene drives that cheat the laws of Mendelian inheritance, that it was going to be possible to drive benign, low-pain, happy genes across uh, entire free-living species remotely in ways that cheat the laws of Mendelian uh, inheritance. Uh, and synthetic gene drives can be used from anything uh, to uh, controlling fertility, cross-species fertility regulation, to spreading happy genes. This is, this is an example of a technology uh, that, uh, first of all, one would be using in a self-contained uh, uh, biosphere to iron out the inevitable teething problems. But yeah, essentially the problem of suffering is tractable. I mean, if a global consensus existed under presumably the auspices of the uh, the, w the WHO, then yeah, a hundred year plan could uh, eliminate uh, all forms of involuntary suffering. Whereas uh, in terms of something like uh, super intelligence, uh, uh, goodness knows, as I said, if we're not going to go down the route of, of cloning with variations of von Neumanns, if one is going to be relying upon genetic tweaking uh, of uh, designer babies, prospective parents choosing for high IQ, uh, combining this with something like Neuralink and Neurochips, uh, it's going to take goodness knows uh, you know, uh, hundreds, thousands, thousands of years. Not, not that superintelligence is 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 is, is well defined. Whereas suffering, uh, yeah. It, though obviously there are complications. At what point does pain become outright suffering? Yeah, the problem of suffering is technically much more tractable. Um, do you think there can be a some form of, uh, um, of formalized formal uh, sort of mathematical language for um, stating philosophical and metaphysical statements um, that uh, could potentially um, talk about even things like uh, suffering and phenomenological binding and, and things like that so that we can potentially be able to, you know, kind of plug in into a compiler and see, okay, does this even, is, are these statements even, even, um, yeah, do they type check? Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, um, I, so I'm kind of uh, asking a slightly tangential uh, maybe question. Uh, uh, let me know if you, if you think this, uh, this question is derailing the discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I haven't got a, a cached uh, response <laughs> uh, here. Uh, uh, in, in a sense, frequently, yeah, the formalization comes after the, uh, uh, the insight. Um, however, something like, you know, like, so though the binding problem, phenomenal binding, 
it might be tempting to treat it as a purely philosophical problem. It's, it's very much a scientific problem because the advantages of the ability to bind are, are demonstrable. And uh, yeah, and it's yeah possible to yeah you can watch kind of YouTube vid videos of people with simultaneous nose. You can only uh, see one object at once. It's incredibly uh, incapacitating. Um, Hugo, yeah. Didn't Leibniz tackle this problem? Leibniz. <laughs> I, I I believe so. Yes, uh, it's. Uh, any, any I mean, it's in a, well, any, so I'm not sure. I think. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Any philosophers in the group can answer this question. Well, I can't, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I think the, the the next presentation is starting, you know, reasonably soon. So um, anybody who wants to take a break beforehand, you're welcome to. Um, let me have a look. Oh, God, where's my... Where's... Yeah, I can't find it now. The schedule, where is it? There it is. There it is. Okay, yes. Yeah, starting at eight. Andreas's talk. Cool. Um, yeah, so David, um, I, I don't know if I can answer the live bits question, but uh, <laughs> do you like in terms of having the idea more become more sort of socially acceptable or digestible or understandable to most people um is that do you think that that's what you'd like to see happen have have the idea of just um you know super happiness go mainstream um and uh, you know promoting the utility of happiness and the disutility of suffering going mainstream in, in in its in a simple form or do you want the more nuanced sort of quantum stuff as well to oh good heavens this is one worry this is one worry i have that my somewhat idiosyncratic views on the hard problem and quantum mind somehow get tied in to the stuff on the biohappiness revolution because it's quite possible to believe everything i've said on uh, quantum, uh you know kind of quantum mind the binding problem constituted panpsychism is complete nonsense and recognize that yeah essentially a medium to long-term goal should be phasing out the biology of suffering it deserves to be mainstream uh and yeah the you know the this, this, this idea yeah. that a new architecture of, of, of mind, gradients of well-being, yeah, it doesn't even deserve to be controversial, in my opinion. Mm. Well, what did you think of um, uh, Yevel Noah Harari's sort of take on something quite similar, it seemed, in his Homo Deus book? Yeah, I don't think he was exactly saying what you were saying, but I saw some parallels it's, remember. Yeah, I mean, he's he's clearly been influenced by uh, the, 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 the transhumanist uh, vision. But in spite of, uh, of, 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 of his work, of, of, you know, obviously my relatively <laughs> limited faltering efforts, it hasn't gone uh, mainstream. And who knows when the breakthrough is going to happen? Uh, it's, I mean, one can, to some extent, I do place one's faith in some kind of 
genetic technological determinism that as the technology matures and you know this this is an understanding of the basis of pain pleasure uh yeah that yeah eventually it'll it'll happen but is it going to take centuries millennia uh Uh, there's a question from Neil to everyone. What does it feel like to be uh, Joe Cameron? Very, very good question. Joe essentially uh, assumed she was normal. She knew she was a sunny, temperamental disposition, but she assumed essentially that she was well within the range of normal human experience. Uh, Someone like Anders Sandberg, another person with an extremely high hedonic set point, although he's been quite widely quoted as, as saying, I do have a ridiculously high hedonic set point. This wasn't something he spontaneously remarked on. It, 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 was, it was prompted um, that, yeah, uh, though it can be very hard if one is temperamentally gloomy, depressive, low hedonic set point uh, to, to recognize this. There are people who just bounce through life, who think life is fundamentally good. They acknowledge there are bad things in this world, but they are socially responsible, uh, insightful. Um, yeah, they do have different uh, 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 biases. Uh, and this is something inevitably one, 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 one worries about. But uh, um, so there's <laughs> what is it? Yeah, what is it like to have an extremely high hedonic set point? I don't know if this has been systematically studied in the same way that uh, depression has been studied. Uh, but it would be wonderful to to see kind of uh, of of well controlled studies. Now, one might naively imagine that the happiest people. They, uh, they take too many risks, therefore they would have reduced life expectancy. But no, this doesn't seem to be the case. The happiest people t tend to, as long as they're not clinically manic or anything, they actually tend uh, to, to live longest. Uh, it's interesting that the, some of the researchers, people focused on questions of existential risk, uh, they are people with extremely high hedonic set points. Uh, they love life. The more one loves life, the more one wants to preserve it. Other things being equal. Uh, uh, uh. Mm. Wow. So I've just seen some other th things. And apologies if you've put comments in the chat and I've missed them. Uh -huh. uh. I love that one. Is um, is there a single ideal state of consciousness or a plurality? <laughs> <laughs> uh, ideal state of consciousness. Oh, just as uh, there are a finite number of perfect games of chess, uh, arguably there are a finite number of perfect states of consciousness. Uh, and that there would be no motivation ever for going out this state space of perfect state of consciousness any more than there would be motivation to play mediocre games of chess. However, I think these perfect states of consciousness uh, depend on a solution to the binding problem. What is the maximally uh, yeah, lar largest possible unitary state of consciousness uh, and the upper bounds are uh, unknown. A sperm whale, I don't think it's possible to have, it's possible to have a Jupiter brain, but it's not possible to have a un unified Jupiter, Jupiter uh, uh, mind. Um, there is some ambiguity talking about the ideal or the perfect state of consciousness in that if one is a, uh, a classical uh, ut utilitarian and one, uh, yeah, uh, then presu presumably uh, the ideal state of consciousness is pure bliss, uh, hence the uh, term orgasmium or hedonium uh, or even utilitronium. 
Uh, and if one is thinking from the perspective of the universe as a whole, point, point of view of the universe, uh, then if one is a classical utilitarian who thinks we should maximize empirically the abundance of positive value in the universe, then once we've phased out experience below hedonic zero, essentially we should be preparing to launch some kind of so-called utilitronium or hedonium shockwave. Um, but yeah, there are complications there in that, uh, 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 yeah, does one aim for just pure bliss or a smaller number of mega blissful minds? I said back to the binding problem again. Um, if one is simply as I am a negative uh, utilitarian, one can keep these options uh, open and that one of the many, many advantages of aiming for hedonic recalibration of life based on information sensitive gradients of well-being is that it's possible to engineer hedonic uplift without asking people to sacrifice their existing values and preferences on the altar of someone else's vision of the good life. And in terms of actually selling the vision of a biohappiness engineering revolution, paradise engineering, this is, uh, I think, extremely important. Whereas very few people, including, I suspect, many classical utilitarians, uh, would buy a utilitronium shockwave which is what we ought to be aiming for, presumably, if we're classical utilitarians.